All right then, 70 tests for the All Blacks. Love talking to this bloke, Andrew Mertens. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, after watching last week, mate, come on. How the heck do we overcome this beast at Ellis Park? Well, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, uh, and, and we've, we've shown um, that we've struggled in the last few years with that really rush uh, physical defence and don't seem to have the, the capacity that maybe we did eight or nine years ago to just pick through defences reasonably easy and uh, skill level um, in terms of what, what's needed when the, when the defence is flying up that quickly hasn't been up to it at the moment. Is there much that we need to do to, to improve? I mean, there's improvement needed across the board for sure, but is it insurmountable? I don't think so. Uh, when, when you actually went, I went back and looked at the All Black Test, you know, the second time I watched it, kind of knowing the result and, and knowing what all the, all the talk was sounding like in New Zealand and that sort of thing, we actually had some periods of really, really good players. Just inevitably, we just get let down on one occasion by a, by a drop ball, which, you know, I'm, I'm not excusing. But there, there are so many, you know, periods of good play that we just un, unfortunately aren't able to capitalise on, which is a concern, of course, if we're creating opportunities and, and not being able to take them. So... Um, but I don't think it was as bad as all that. And, um, you know, maybe I'm just looking from the perspective of someone who played in that team between 98 and 2002 when we lost the Blazers Cup and couldn't get it back and uh, lost to the French in that World Cup semi final. So maybe I've got a bit of sympathy and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to when times were actually worse, probably, than they are now. OK, I want to get back to that. But look, I mean, you, you know, your, your perception and your analysis is exactly why we have you on, mate, because, look, the mass media here have already written their narrative. You know, it's all blaming Ian Foster and he's got to go and it's all his fault and all of these kind of things. Yet we had Murray Mix dead on and we had Justin Marshall on on Monday. And Mix, the first thing he said was, said, look, I agree with Ian Foster. It was a really improved performance. It was an improved performance in the line-out and especially defence. Mertz, look, they scored one try off a big bomb which hit Bowden on the head. It could have bounced anywhere. They got a great pass away. The second try they scored in rubbish time at the end of the game where we were trying to you know, try something under our own post. Yep. So between those two times, we didn't concede a try. So that's got to be something positive, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I mean, both. both it's not like they outmaneuvered us and, and, and constructed things really well and that we were left, left wanting. It was two opp- opportunist try, the only two tries they scored. Plus, you've got to say, and you know, Kiwis are obviously very good at this and I don't want to sound like I'm blaming the ref again, but you've got to say they got a tremendous leg up on any 50-50 calls went their way, particularly ones that were within Andre Pollard's range. And there were a couple of penalties that I would have thought at least were dubious at best. And I think they got a fairly big leg up from, I mean, output into the scrum. And, you know, Angus Tarver has had issues with referees for years in terms of giving away penalties. So I'm not saying he wasn't at fault. But, you know, output into a scrum and suddenly it turns around to a free kick to South Africa. Then they set a scrum on that free kick and get a penalty and suddenly thump the ball down into our end and for the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes in that first half, the All Black weren't able to get out of their 22. So, they, you know, they got a little bit of a leg up at times. I don't want to take away from the South African victory at all. They're a bloody good team. They're the world champions. They're playing at home. Is there shame in losing to them like that? No. Um, result-wise, no. Performance-wise, can we improve? Most definitely. But should it be as doom and gloom as people are saying? No, even statistically, and I don't want to sound like just a, a career loser. I know I was, but um, <laughs> you know, we've, we've lost five out of the last six tests, but against the, probably the three, well, they are ranked the three top teams in the world. Ireland, I, I couldn't see anyone beating them in a three-test series at the moment, possibly including South Africa. France is outstanding in building depth and, and building consistency as well. And South Africa, the world champions. So, you know, is it as bad as all that? Um, I, I don't think it is. Does that mean we, we, we applaud and say, oh, you know, everything's rosy? No, it's not. But uh, I don't think it's as bad as, as, pe- as some people are making out. Andrew Mertens is with us. We're talking, of course, about going to Joburg, 3 a.m. up on the high vault on Sunday on the platform. All right. So 
When you look hard and fast at their performance, though, uh, they were magnificent with Malcolm Marks on the turnovers. They dominated territory. We couldn't line break through them. Um, their rush defence was absolutely suffocating us. Every time we made a break, it was the inside ball. We, we had an ankle tap on one. We dropped one. They put that scoreboard pressure on. What I'm trying to say, Mertz, is you've been in enough situations like this. They played and looked to me like we do to teams. They just suffocate them, drill down their end, never let them get out. And then, of course, you're chasing the three points the whole time. Yeah, that's right. And, and probably where more of our inaccuracies lie are in, are in defence. And, you know, we allowed Ireland to get on the front foot against us across that whole series. Uh, similarly, England in that World Cup semi-final in 29 got on the on the front foot and just had us backpedalling and, and we gave up too many easy yards. Some of the penalties don't help, obviously. but And, and some of those marks turnovers as well. I'm, I'm so frustrated with all the refereeing at the moment in terms of not allowing a ruck to be formed. You know, if there's contact from a support player on a defensive player over the ball, then they've got to get their hands off it. And if they don't already have the rights to the ball, and on most of these occasions they shouldn't be accorded rights to the ball, then they've got to get their hands off it. And we've got to allow the ruck to to be created. Otherwise, if every breakdown is too loaded in favour of the defence, then then we get a stagnant um, and a poor spectacle, a stagnant game, because because the defence, it's too easy for the defence to nullify the attack. We want to allow an attack to, to build some pressure, to build some phases, and to get some sort of advantage. And then we'll see better rugby or we'll see, you know, we won't see the stop start, we won't see the penalties. I mean, how many of these players are getting over the ball, sticking their hands on it? They're not really trying to steal it. They're just keeping the ball in there because they know as the defensive team, they're going to earn a penalty. And that's wrong in my view. But anyway, that's another whole whole thing. Um, what was the question again, mate? I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to ask you about is they're going to play exactly the same way. They're going to rush out, rush up in defence. They're going to box kick. And obviously in the high belt, that's going to go high. We're not at the moment dealing with that like an 9 We just couldn't seem to get our heads around how to actually handle that aerial attack. Um, but the rush defence first and, f- and foremost... You know, and since 2017, when the Lions come, we've never really figured out. There are two ways. I mean, here, here's me and Numdi trying to trying to tell you, but I, I think there are two ways, obviously, through it. One of them is the inside pass, where you've got to break their line and go. The other is obviously with a better, more efficient kicking game. And I suppose the third, if I attach one, is clearing the ball quicker. Uh, you know, is that right? And if so, how do we correct all of those? Well, look, I think some of it comes down to what appears to be communication and I think it looks like sometimes when we're trying to get quick transfers away, we're not accurate with our pass because we don't have a good reference point on where the where the receiver is. So I wonder if maybe the communication needs to come up a little bit, and, and in particular needs to be earlier and uh, and and more precise around where you are. You know, so giving giving a guy an option before he gets the ball, so he knows when where to flick it on and, and how quickly, etc. That's one of the things. The other thing is I, I would like to see a bit more running lines now. I'm from, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, so clearly rugby has evolved. So I may be well out of touch, but when defences used to come up and in, and they didn't do it very often back in my era, but when they did, the key was to actually be punching on an outward line because if the outside defence comes up, then the gaps is for an attack is actually angling outwards. Rather, than What they want you to do is, is get forced back in. So I'd love to see a few more options, you know, because at the moment we've got the front wave, we can either hit them or we can hit the wave behind. I'd love to see a few more options of, of, of blokes just being available on just on the outside shoulder. You can sit on the inside and wait around a Bodie Barrett or wait around a David Havili and then at the last minute just get on their shoulder. And that is the way to punch through those holes when a defence is, is lining up and coming up from out to in. That's where the, the biggest gaps are. So I'd like to see a bit more of that. I'd love to see the wingers sort of hovering a little bit more and kind of given, given that roving licence to just sort of pop up where the opportunities are and then then we can do what the All Blacks have been best in the world at in the, in the last sort of 15 years, is reacting quickly to the picture that they're presented by the defence. Um, and I don't think we've been so good at that lately. In saying that, you know, who knows what, what, what the master plan is, because, you know, we're working to four-year cycles. Some of the selections and things like that, we build our depth, which doesn't allow, sometimes doesn't allow combinations to form, that the top combinations. So, you know, we're still not probably sure what our best midfield combination no. is at the moment. So 
it, it is difficult and they are working to a plan and you know none of us are privy to what they're doing day to day in the All Black camp and what their thoughts are long term. I mean, uh, I've mentioned it before as well. Um, love Bodie Barrett, but I, I, I struggle to see why Richie Monga hasn't had more time on the field up till now. We've, we've played four tests and he's been limited spirit, used sparingly. But that might be part of the plan to load him up a little more in the later stages of the season. So I don't know that. But uh, you know, on the face of it, I, I didn't mind seeing Moonga come on um, and, and Bodie going to fullback. You know, he's pretty devastating when he's got space and, and, and time and can uh, can stretch those legs out a little bit. And you know, I, I'd, I'd like to see Moonga get more time. I'd, I'd still like to see them play together. But um, you know, some of the things uh, selection-wise, they're working to their plan, and we don't know necessarily what that is. Love to see Rico Ioane. I mean, if you put him at 13, you want to see him getting the ball early, and it's easier said than done sometimes with the defences these days, but just, I mean, his pace, don't you put him in centre so he can get that outside break and and start to use his pace, and we just haven't seen him get that opportunity. Will Jordan didn't really get a chance at all in that match. Uh, When he did, he tried to make something out of nothing and kick the ball into touch the poor guy, so um, you know, I, I wonder, you know, in the midfield, if they might, might do a little tinkering just this week, just to change the picture, and possibly in the back row as well. Andrew Merton, seventy tests for us, magnificent careers with the All Blacks, and now hosting and presenting on Australian uh, Stan Sport for Australia. Look, going through, I want to hark back. Okay, ninety six, ninety seven. We lost one test in Joburg at the end of ninety six after beating the box overseas. Historic ninety seven. We went unbeaten and drew with England. I think it was in the last test. So you come off those two years. Five losses in a row in 98. We get bottled in the semi-final against France. And as you say, we just can't get over the hump against Aussie in 00, 01, 02. So just inside your own head, inside that camp, when the coach is under so much stress and pressure and everything, how how really difficult is it to avoid all the outside noise and somehow make some progress? Oh, impossible. Impossible. And you're always trying to, you know, focus on the task and, you know, look after what's under your control but it is tough and you do feel the weight of the world and uh, so you know I do, I do have sympathy for the group they're all, they're all out there doing their absolute utmost for, for the country so there's no lack of commitment or anything like that um, it's you know and it's, it's, it's a little too simplistic to say it's just not working for us but you know, maybe at times on the field we are trying too hard as well. That happens with, with any team, whether it's under 15s or, or you know, right through to internationals. You know, players just trying too hard and trying to not beat the world themselves, but to solve the problems and contribute to the team because they know they're under pressure. So, you know, it's tough. It would be, be lovely to say to these guys, oh, you know, I hope you can relax and play your game. But the reality is they're not going to be able to in the, in the current context and going to one of the world's most daunting um, grounds in Ellis Park so you know I do have a lot of sympathy I just hope they have the confidence to, to keep playing and um, I also ha- hope that our skills are more up to it uh, in terms of that torrid environment on the field than they have been you know against the Irish and against South Africa can we do it yeah absolutely I think we can but it's, it's going to take work and it's going to take effort and like I say I just wonder if the communication needs to be a lot clearer a lot uh, earlier and a lot more precise when we need to, you know, pass those, get those quick transfers away when there are opportunities. And, and there are still opportunities. You know, a team coming out to win. I think we saw the ball used once last week where Geordie Barrett ripped a big pass and it probably went out too far. It went out to Caleb Clark and he tried to make something out of it. And that swarming South African defence got across to him in time and knocked him over the, the sideline. So it was moments like that that we didn't quite capitalise on what the opportunities were. And plus we gave South Africa back some, some pretty cheap balls. So, you know, the only probably three or four occasions in the game that you knock that out of your game and, and, and those things don't happen and the whole picture changes in the game and uh, I'm sure they will have worked pretty hard on the scrum because giving those scrum penalties away as well that, that's just easy yards for the South Africans A couple more questions, we'll let you go it's absolutely brilliant listening to you look, when you go to Joburg, how, how much difference does the altitude make in terms of the height, the reach, the power you get with your kicks and all of that for a start and also I also want to ask you, talking to Marshy on Monday, he said there is no better sound than shutting the them up in that stand and making it go silent. So, I mean, that's the way that, you know, first bit you beat them psychologically, get the crowd, you know, quietening for a start. But also just in terms of the aerial attack that they're going to give us, how much extra does that that does that does high vault provide? It does give, give a bit extra. I, was, I shouldn't comment on whether, how it is to shut the crowd up there. Mark, you know about it. I wouldn't. I didn't, I didn't, no, I didn't play. Well, I, didn't what, play I can't remember. What happened to you in 96? Yeah, Carlos, what? 
Good. Carlos played in 97 Seven, when yes. we won at Alice yeah. Park. And uh, 96, we lost there. It was the last... Yeah, uh, and Simon, test Simon played there, didn't We'd already won the series. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, no, I played in that last test. Uh, I, I got brought in for the South Africans to, to win a test. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't think I ever won at Alice Park, not against the box. So it's look, it's a tough environment. The All Blacks have won there, but it's really, really tough. But you know, as, as Marshy says, if you hold on to the ball and, and, and get on top and take the, the crowd out of the picture, then yes, it's a, it's a great feeling. It's an exhilarating feeling to, to do that up there. But it's uh, you know, it's tough. Um, what was the other part of the question again? Sorry, yeah, you answered both. Chatting, no, you answered both of those. Losses. No, you answered both <laughs> of those. So the final thing I was just going to say is, look, I thought Aussie put in 41 on Argentina and Argentina. I know that two tries came late, but given the fact that Michael Hooper had come back and the injuries and everything, and, and plus Argentina put their A-team out on deck, I thought there was a hell of a result, mate. I really did. I thought they did really, really well. Yeah, they've been decimated by injuries. Um, and then Reese Hodge, who, you know, three, four weeks ago was in the Australia A squad, didn't make the Wallabies, suddenly turns around and he's come in and played a, a pretty crucial role when Quade Cooper went off. So uh, I thought he did fantastically well. But, yeah, they're, they're really down on, uh, on on their numbers, the, the Wallabies, and, and did incredibly well. They've got a, a number of players still back here in Australia, the likes of Andrew Calloway with a hamstring. So, yeah, that was a great result. I didn't think Argentina, I mean, cut it us at 10, tried to play more than perhaps Nicolas Sanchez uh, would have. And I think Sanchez would have put a lot more heat on Tom Wright back at fullback and just test him out. It was his first start in internationals at fullback and he didn't really get tested and got to got to pop up here and there and have some nice touches. So, yeah, it was a really impressive victory. Like you say, they've, they've brought in the, all the big guns. They've got Crevy there who comes on after Montoya has done all the damage at hooker as well. So they have thrown everything into it, Argentina. That was a really impressive win from the Wallabies and uh, maybe not quite getting the credit yet that it deserves.